Good morning. Let's stand and sing this song of preparation as we address one another with song. Welcome those coming in with our voices as we sing and prepare to begin. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray your kingdom come. preparation to call one another in to our gathering and now hear God call us to worship from his word from Psalm 100. One of my favorite calls to worship, Psalm 100. We could do this one every week and I think you'll see why. I'll begin and then we can all respond. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Now together. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Yes, we do not enter into his gates, into his presence because of, of who we were but because of who he is and who he has made us. He has made us, and we are his people, his sheep. We do not enter because we first loved him, but because of his steadfast love for us. And that is worthy of our thanks, worthy of our praise, and worthy of our joyfully noisiest voices. So let us sing out and sing for joy. Yes. 
Songs like that remind us that following Jesus isn't just about rules, but it's about joy, about loving, adoring the King of all creation. And that's what we're here to do this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to this worship gathering of Desert Springs Church. My name is Alex Schroeder and I'm one of the pastors here. And this worship gathering is not just a great way to start the week. And it's not just a good way to meet new people in Albuquerque. No, this is a time for us as God's children to draw near, to exalt him, and to hear from our Father. And if you're new with us, welcome. We count it a great privilege that you would come be with us this Sunday morning and do those things, to draw near to God, to exalt him, and to hear from him. If you are new and you have questions about our church, we welcome them and invite you at the end of our service, we'll have some pastors down front. Please come down, and we'd welcome any question you have about our church, what we believe, why we do certain things, and we'd love to just get to know you and pray for you as well. So please, we invite you, uh, come down and introduce yourself. We also, uh, if you would rather not come down, you can send us an email. Uh, we have an, in, an email ready for you, info at dscabq.com. Please send any questions or prayer requests you have, and we'll respond to you in due time. Well, we are getting closer and closer to the finishing of our building project, and today you have new visual evidence that that's true. The tarp that has sat st stationary in our foyer for months is now removed, and you can see the first fruits of what this finished project will be like. What well, we do ask you while you're able to look at it, be encouraged by it, uh, we do not want anybody to walk past those little, like, I don't know what they're called, I call them zippy things that, like, rope things off. Don't walk through those. Uh, it's open for you to look at, but it's not open for you to walk around in just yet. But I do hope that seeing that is an encouragement to you to continue to be praying for this project. Uh, we do believe that we need the Lord's help uh, in these final weeks to get this project done and done on time. I do want to put one upcoming event on your radar, though I would be surprised if it's not on your radar yet. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, I'm talking about Claris. This is our annual theology conference. I looked today on our, on our calendar, we're five weeks away from the Sunday where we'll be concluding Claris, hearing a sermon from Pastor Ramel Williams. I will say, we often call Claris a theology conference. I don't want that to be intimidating to any of you. Just because we call it theology conference doesn't mean it's just for seasoned theologians or people that think that they love theology. 
we designed this conference with you in mind. So you might think the Apostle Paul doesn't sound immediately helpful as a theme, but here are some of the things we're going to explore uh, in the sermons that these uh, speakers are going to be bringing to us that weekend. Questions like this. How should a Christian confront and disagree with another Christian? That sounds really practical to me. Or how about this? How should Christians think about their personal weaknesses and limitations? I want to know more of that. Or what is the nature and character of God like when we as Christians are driven to despair? These are it's the themes of the Apostle Paul, but these are going to be expositions that are helpful, practical, instructive to us in the day in and day out of our lives. So we hope that is a further reminder, please come. And then there's so much else that will be going on. You've heard about the singing, the book giveaways, just the fellowship that will take place between you and other believers. It's going to be a sweet weekend, so we hope you come. Real quick, let me do this. If you've come to Eclaris before, raise your hand and keep it up. So for those of you that are new to our church, and when I say new, I mean have been here since 2019, um, and haven't gone to Eclaris, Notice all the hands around you. If you, wanna, if you want someone to tell you why you should come, go to one of those folks with a hand up and ask them, hey, what's Claris like? You've gone before. Should I go? We're confident the answer will be yes. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, real quick, to conclude this announcement on Claris, we're about one month away from registration closing. So if you haven't registered yet, there will be a time when you will not be able to register. So take advantage of that now. And if you have questions about registration or if the cost is prohibitive, please come talk to me. Now I invite you to join with me as we pray for these things. Father, we thank you for the building that you have given us. God, thank you for this space that has served us so well these past months. Uh, Father, we anticipate the finishing of this project and all the new rhythms and sweet things it will bring to our church. God, getting to worship together in one service again. Getting to use this space in a different way to equip the saints for faithfulness in this life. God, we thank you for the chance for our youth and teenagers in our church to get to uh, meet together and be discipled. Lord, we pray and ask that you would give help for the remaining work that's still to be done. May it go well. Be with those laboring to finish it. God, may there be no more delay or hiccup. Father, we pray in particular for those inspections that are coming. May they go well. May there be nothing that prevents us from gaining occupancy of this new space. Lord, we ask that as we enter into having a new building, that your glory would continue to spread through our church broader and deeper. God, may more people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent of their sins and trust in your son. Lord, we do lift up Claris as well. We pray already for our speakers, Ramel Williams and Tom Schreiner. God, help them as they prepare their teachings. We pray that you would use them to instruct us in your word and that all that would be there would be edified in their, in their faith. And Father, may you move among us now as we sing your praise and as we hear from your word read and as we pray to you and as we sit under your word. Father, use this Lord's Day gathering to build up your church into maturity. We pray in Christ's name, amen. <laughs> Let's stand now and sing this confession of sin. To sing our sorrow, our sickness, and sin, and take it to Jesus to find his gladness, his light, his help. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and light, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness and into thy health, out of thy wanting and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come Out of our shame Out of my shameful failure and loss Jesus, I come Jesus, I come 
together. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're my best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I
23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. us boast in nothing but Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all
hearts. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we want to call your attention to the new mothers and new babies in our congregation. We are thankful for the gift of motherhood you have given to our new mothers. We know and trust that these new babies will bring joy to their mothers and that through your spirit will grow young moms to be more like Christ. We pray that you would give these new mothers strength and endurance as their days can be long and exhausting. Help them to not find their strength in themselves, but in you as they serve their baby and all the other responsibilities they have. May the challenge of this new phase of life further reveal their need for Jesus in each moment of their day. This phase of life is difficult. It's so easy for new mothers to feel like they aren't being as productive as they should be or to compare themselves to other mothers. We pray that you would regularly remind them of your sovereign hand that has put them in this phase of life that they don't need to do any marvelous works to earn your favor, but they simply need to be faithful to you and the place you have put them. And when they feel inadequate, we pray that they would turn to you to find full acceptance and unrelenting love. Lord, help our congregation to come alongside these new mothers. Help the older women to teach the new mothers what it looks like to fellowship with Christ when there's nights of no sleep, or the baby won't stop crying. Help our church gatherings to be a renewing reprieve for weary mothers. May our connection to Christ be deeper than family ties, and may that be seen clearly by the way we serve our new mothers in the church. Lastly, Lord, we pray for the new babies in our congregation. Lord, our most earnest desire for all our children is that they know you, that they know your love, the power of your salvation, your joy that sustains us in good times and bad. We pray that you would start preparing the ground of these young hearts to receive the seeds of your word. Prepare their homes to be a place of discipleship. Help their homes to be little heavenly outposts where they are raised to love the ways of the kingdom and to share your beauty with their neighbors. Father, we are so thankful for new life and the mothers that you use them to bring into the world. We pray that you would continue to grow our families and that you would grow our church. Amen. Let us stand continue in prayer through song. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be
is our prayer as we turn to your word once again this morning, that Christ, our ruler and king, would be an all-consuming vision before our eyes and in our lives. Lord, give us a fresh, enlarged vision of our Savior and King and his gracious kingdom. May it be so for our good and for your glory. Amen. You can be seated. Well, we're in Matthew chapter 19 and 20 today, if you have a Bible with you. In the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in our Bibles, people frequently come to Jesus with questions. By some calculations, Jesus is asked 183 different questions in the gospels. Some are well-intended, some are not. Some questions are about trivial matters or matters of controversy. Others are more weighty, more significant, and more relevant for us today. Well, in our study of Matthew's account today, we come to several questions that are put to Jesus, several more that he asks in response, as we'll see. But at least two questions put to Jesus stand out in our text for their weightiness, their significance, their relevance. Here they are. What must I do to have eternal life? And who can be saved? What must I do to have eternal life? Who can be saved? These are questions that every one of us must ask questions that every one of us should have firm answers to. They are questions of our eternal state, our standing before God. So if you would, look down in your Bibles as I read, starting in Matthew 19, verse 16, and we'll read all the way to chapter 20, verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. 
What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Well, all this material really does go together. You'll notice that proverbial saying at the end of chapter 19, many who are first will be last and the last first, which is picked up but inversed in chapter 20, verse 16, so the last will be first and the first last. Or we could think of how many different synonyms of salvation are used in our passage to help us see that this is all about the same stuff. Eternal life, entering life, having treasure in heaven, the kingdom of heaven, also called the kingdom of God, which, by the way, those are synonymous. Being saved is talk about, inheriting eternal life. The kingdom of heaven is like, followed by a parable. Again, these phrases are all synonymous about, well, the Christian life, becoming a Christian, following Christ. Elsewhere in the Bible, it's called being redeemed, reconciled to God, forgiven of our sins, and the like. These are words about one's eternal, final destiny, whether they go to heaven or hell. And yet, they're also about the spiritual realm that anyone who follows Christ enters into even now. The kingdom. The kingdom is the realm of Christ's rule, and eventually that will be a whole new heaven and new earth, a new world, as our passage puts it. But even now, the kingdom is at hand. It's here. It's among us. We prayed and sang, thy kingdom come, earlier. And we can enter into it now. Our passage has three parts to it. Did you notice there's a conversation between Jesus and a rich man, followed by Jesus debriefing with the disciples about the conversation with the rich man, and then Jesus tells a parable. I'll word our outline for today, not so much with what happens, like I just did, but what each of those sections teaches us. 
about entering the kingdom of heaven. So first, entering the kingdom of heaven starts with need. It starts with recognizing our neediness before God, that we lack something. That's what we get from the conversation between Jesus and the rich man. This is likely within the same scene of the previous verses, by the way, where Jesus welcomed children and taught how those children were a perfect illustration for how anyone, young or old, enters the kingdom of heaven. So notice, Matthew introduces our passage in verse 16 with the word, Behold! Behold, a man came up. Again, the same scene. This man enters it, and he comes up to Jesus. Who is this man? Well, we're not given a whole lot of detail. Luke's account tells us that he was a ruler, a ruler of the synagogue. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all refer to him as very rich. He's often referred to as the rich young ruler. This is that guy. And what a guy he is. Don't let your familiarity with this story or how you know it ends spoil that it begins on an optimistic note. Mark's account tells us that this man came up running to Jesus and knelt before him. He came to Jesus, indicating some measure of belief in Jesus and submission to Jesus. He calls Jesus teacher. And he asks Jesus a question. Not a gotcha question like the Pharisees ask, but an honest question, a very personal question, an all-important question. What must I do to have eternal life? This man cares about his eternal standing before God. This man cares about what happens to his soul when he dies. And perhaps some here today need to start right there. I mean, just thinking outside of tomorrow in the next year and how much money you might make five years from now to think of where you will stand before God when you die. This man cared. And he knows he lacks something. Or at least he's suspicious that he lacks something. He wants to know, is there something he's missing? That's all very good. And yet, something is amiss in the way he asks it. Did you notice that? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Apparently, he's assuming that any lack he has, anything that's still needed in his soul, is something he can fix, something he can do. And so Jesus responds, not by picking at that point directly, but by zooming out on what or who is good. He wanted to know what good thing he should do. And Jesus says, verse 17, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good, implying that it's God. Now, Jesus isn't denying here that he knows what's good or that he isn't good. In fact, he's very subtly inferring that he does know what's good and he is God. He wants the man to slow down, to not focus on his deeds, on his doing but to focus on where you go, or to whom you go, rather, for the answers about eternal life. God is good. God determines what is good. Only God can answer the questions of eternal life. And the Father God has revealed those answers in Jesus, His Son, and God in the flesh, who came to reveal God's glory and his grace. 
Jesus wants this man to begin to think of who he's talking to. So verse 17 says a lot about Jesus indirectly, implicitly, but it also says something about the man asking the question. Because if only God is good and this rich man isn't God, obviously, then he isn't good either. He isn't good. None of us are. No, not one. We're not God. So we're not innately good. And we don't have the answers within. Jesus continues in a surprising way, but actually a very perfectly fitting way for one who would think that he's pretty good, only needs a, a little bump up, a little extra credit maybe. So Jesus responds by directing the man to the commandments, to more law-keeping. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And then he lists the commandments of the Ten Commandments, commandments 5 through 9. And then he adds Leviticus 19, 18, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the second half of the Ten Commandments, what's sometimes called the, the second table of the law, the second half of the Ten Commandments focus on our interactions with others. The first four focus more vertically towards our relationship with God. Commands 5 through 10 focus more on our horizontal relationships with others, as does Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why does Jesus focus on these commandments specifically? Well, they're sort of uniquely uh, concrete, objective, almost visibly identifiable. That helps. And perhaps the second half of the Ten Commandments also hint at ways that this man has become rich. Maybe he hasn't loved his neighbor as himself, and his riches are the very means. His not loving neighbor is the very means by which he's garnered his wealth. But we could ask a broader question, not just why these commandments, but why, why commandments? Why is Jesus giving this guy law? This guy's a, he's got a problem with his deeds and his doing, and Jesus directs him to more deeds and doing. Why not grace? Why not gospel? Well, the law, Galatians 3 tells us, is a schoolmaster to prepare us for Christ. The law was meant to expose sin. It was meant to show us our ability, our need. What we find in the gospel accounts is Jesus interacts with people, with those who are painfully aware of their sinfulness, their need, like the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus just goes straight to grace. But for those who are proud and those who think that they're doing pretty well, Jesus gives them more law not grace, because they're not ready for grace. They don't see their need. And remember how Jesus just finished teaching about how entering the kingdom of heaven is like becoming like a child, a child, dependent, needy. He said back in Matthew 18, verse 3, unless you turn and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus wants this man to find and feel his need. Is he needy? Is he ready for grace? Verse 20, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? It's breathtaking in its presumption and blindness and smugness. He's asking Jesus if Jesus has any, like, super commandments. Like, is there an AP class for me? Because I've been getting A pluses ever since I was a kid. Honor father and mother, A plus. 
Don't murder? A plus. Do you have any AP classes for me? This man is not ready for grace, and so Jesus gives him more law. And now it is Jesus' own law specifically for this man. Verse 21, if you would be perfect, literally complete, then go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, Jesus doesn't give this command to every one of us. In fact, this is the only time I believe in the Gospels that Jesus tells someone to sell all that they have. Jesus is not saying to this man or to anyone else that by giving away their money, they can earn a spot in heaven. No, Jesus was testing this man. Jesus was putting his finger on this man's greatest roadblock to faith, his wealth. And proof that he wasn't ready for grace, proof that his riches were an idol getting in the way. Verse 22, the man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions, and he wasn't willing to part with them. When faced with a choice between Jesus and his stuff, he clung to his stuff and rejected Christ. He came to Jesus desperate for the answers about eternal life. So it seemed, but he wasn't desperate enough. Entering the kingdom starts with need. If you're not there, you won't even get the grace of God, the good news of the gospel that's offered. God wants to bring you to the end of yourself that you might find only rest and comfort and salvation in Jesus, not you. That's the first lesson, the first part of our passage. The second Entering the kingdom is difficult, but utterly worth it. It's difficult, but it's worth it. After the man went away sad, Jesus turned to his disciples to teach them about what just happened. And he said in verse 23, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Riches make it difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wealth is not inherently evil. It doesn't say in the Bible, money is the root of all evil. It says love of money is the root of all evil. But Jesus does teach, Matthew 6, for instance, that wealth is powerful. It has God-like properties about it. Money can often be a God-replacing, God-substituting kind of thing. Wealth can be a substitute satisfaction for God. Wealth can be one's identity in a way that only God should be. Wealth can be easily something that we trust in, that we rely on. Having money bails you out of some things. Even Ecclesiastes speaks to this, even though a little sarcastically. It says, money solves all things. Does it? Well, no, but yeah. It'll get you out of a pickle. And those wealthy are more tempted than those not to not feel needy. Who prays more, the poor or the rich? Those in trouble or those at ease? It's only with difficulty that a wealthy person can see their need, their need for grace. 
And by the way, it's easy for us to think that the wealthy, the rich, are those people who make more than us, whatever that is, right? You make 50,000, those who make 75,000, that's rich. You make 125,000, you know who you think is rich? People who make 150 or 200,000. We always think it's just a little bit above us. That's the category of rich. But just about everybody in this room is rich if we're thinking historically and globally, right? If you transported the rich man of this story to your living room and to your car, he would be very impressed. We're rich. So it is to people like us that Jesus warns. It's difficult to come into the kingdom of heaven with so much stuff. In fact, it's impossible. He raises the stakes in verse 24. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. So maybe if you're taking notes and you wrote down difficult, you might want to just put parentheses or near that impossible exclamation point. That's what Jesus is saying here. He gives us a, a humorous, hyperbolic metaphor. He takes the, the largest animal in Palestine in those days, a camel, and, and imagines a camel fitting through the smallest hole available in their days, the eye of a needle. He says, a rich guy entering the kingdom is like getting that camel through that hole. In other words, you can't. It doesn't. It's impossible. You may have heard this passage taught like this, that in Jesus' day there was some actual small gate. It was kind of nicknamed the needle gate. And camels could barely fit through it, but they had to get rid of all their cargo and get down on their knees and shimmy through. Well, except that, that thing, that needle gate, didn't really exist in Jesus' day. It only came to be a thing about 1100 A.D. So the point is not that it's hard or that camels barely fit in the eye of the needle no, Jesus is using absurdity and hyperbole to illustrate the impossibility of rich people seeing their need for grace. Later parts of the New Testament expand on this idea, not limiting it to the rich. We call that idea, later taught in the New Testament, also found in the Old Testament for that matter, we call it total depravity or spiritual inability. It's in passages like Romans 3.11, no man seeks after God. Or Romans 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Or 1 Corinthians 2, that the natural man doesn't even receive the things of God. Or Ephesians 2, that you, Paul writes to those believers, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. There's a spiritual inability that's true for everyone. It's just often especially true for the rich who have this tangible means of distracting them from their need. The disciples are astonished at all this. Verse 25 they ask, who then can be saved? What an important question. And you have to understand some background here, why they were so astonished. It's because the disciples, like pretty much every Jewish person at that time, had a wrong assumption that one's wealth was proof of acceptance with God. They believed that riches and righteousness went hand in hand. 
They had the theology of Job's friends, if you remember that, as we studied the book of Job earlier this summer. So the disciples assumed that this wealthy guy with his A pluses, with his synagogue leadership, I mean, this guy's a shoe in for the kingdom. This is the kind of guy who gets like picked out of the line at the gate of heaven. And, and Peter just says, oh, not you. I mean, don't wait in line. Come on, get in here, you. They assumed this guy would be in first. First. Remember that word. So Jesus' words, so Jesus' words about the, the difficulty of wealthy people entering, the, the impossibility of wealthy people entering the kingdom, that's shaking up everything for the disciples. Who then can be saved? Aren't you thankful there's an answer to that? Jesus says, verse 26, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Our God loves to shove fat camels through little eyes of needles left and right, and this room is full of people like that. Remember, Charles Wesley taught us to sing, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. But thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon filled with light. My chains fell off, my heart went free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. Praise God. If you're not a Christian yet, perhaps today God would do this kind of enlightening work in you. Perhaps today he would shove you through the eye of a needle. It'd take a miracle, right? You think, not me. You're not going to get me. Well, we also used to say that as well before we became Christians. Just know that no one is outside the reach of an omnipotent, omnigenerous God. You're not outside his reach. Pray for him to do what only he can do. And if you were a Christian, if this is true of you, I'll just stand in awe once again. Thank God afresh for what he did. Remember again, it was impossible until God made it possible. Now back to our story. Notice Peter's calculation and question that follows in verse 27 then Peter said, in reply to this, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Peter's trying his best to put the puzzle pieces together. The first part was true. The disciples literally had left home and land and family and businesses to follow Jesus. So the subsequent question Peter asks is, is somewhat understandable. Remember Jesus said to the rich man in the hearing of the disciples, sell all you have and you will have treasure in heaven. Peter's thinking, so what do we get? Jesus answers him, notice this, not with a rebuke, with a slight correction and even greater motivation. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, in the new world, the new heaven, the new earth, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, hinting at Daniel 7, what was promised there, you who have followed me, 
referring to the 12 apostles in this case, will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is astounding. This ragtag group of fishermen, a tax collector, nobodies. Jesus says to them, do you have any idea what awaits you? Do you have any idea of the privilege and authority and proximity to me that awaits you? Do you have any idea what we're going to do together in a new heaven and a new earth? And then Jesus says in verse 29, everyone who has left houses or family or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and eternal life. A hundredfold. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Heaven is described to us as unimaginably great. When Revelation 21 and 22 describes heaven for us, the word like keeps getting used. Not because John is a teenager and overuses like. Because <laughs> it's like this, it's like that. It's not, it's not that, it's like that, it's like that. It's unimaginably great. So any and all sacrifices made for Christ in his kingdom in this life will be utterly more than compensated in the next life. It will be worth it. Romans 8, 18, the present sufferings we're going through aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed to us. David Livingstone, that great pioneer missionary to Africa in the 1800s. He once was preaching to students in Cambridge. And he said to them about the missionary sacrifice. He said, people talk of the sacrifice that I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity or the consciousness of doing good or peace of mind? Or the bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. It is privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger. These things make one pause. They may cause the spirit to waver. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Livingston concludes succinctly, I never made a sacrifice. <laughs> if you know what he went through, you, you know how remarkable that is. Entering the kingdom is difficult. It's even impossible. But with God, it is very possible. And any sacrifice that is made for the kingdom will be more than worth it. Now thirdly, we come to the parable. The lesson here is that entering the kingdom is all of grace. Again, it's the same setting, right? Jesus is continuing to talk even though our Bibles begin a whole new chapter. Remember, it's not that Matthew wrote down those chapter and verse numbers. Someone added those later to help us follow along in corporate gatherings like this. Sometimes it's really helpful where they put the marks, the breaks, and sometimes it's not. And this is one of those where it's not. Now, Jesus gives this parable on the heels of all that's come before, the conversation with the rich man, the debriefing with the disciples, Peter's question about what we get. And Jesus condescendingly tells him how great the rewards will be. But he now gives a parable to show rewards, grace, whatever you're talking about. It's all of grace. It's all his doing. It's a parable about a landowner who hires day laborers to work in his field. 
There are five different groups of workers hired at different times of the day. By the way, in those days, uh, the clock kind of went like this. Hour one is 6 a.m., and it goes on from there. And so what plays out in the story of the parable is over a typical work day of 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So one group of workers is hired at hour one, 6 a.m., with the intent of working the full day of 12 hours for the agreed amount, a denarius, which was a full day's wage. Imagine whatever minimum wage is times 8 or 10 or 12 hours, and that's basically what we're talking about. Three hours later, the landowner sees others not working. He puts them to work. He hires them. Then, verse 5, he does the same three hours later, and then the same three hours after that. And then the 11th hour came. It's 5 p.m. now. And he hires another group of workers for the last hour. And with this last group, there's a quick conversation between the landowner and these workers. Verse 6, why do you stand idle all day? Verse 7, the answer, because no one has hired us. This is really important. It really helps us understand the parable. The issue here is not the laziness of these 11th hour workers. It doesn't say that they didn't turn up to work until 5 p.m. because they've been sleeping in late and goofing off all day. No one would hire them. Who doesn't get hired down at the docks or whatever day laborer company you can think of today? Who doesn't get hired? The little guy, the injured, the infirmed, the disabled. These are people who need money and showed up to work and they just kept getting passed over and passed over and passed over. And they're so desperate. It's 5 p.m. And they haven't left yet. They haven't left yet. And so the landowner hiring them was not because of some last-minute need in the field that the parable never mentions. It's out of his generosity. It's out of his generosity. And that's proven not only in their hiring and in their employment, but even more in their pay. It's pay time, 6 p.m. And the landowner has those who came last be paid first. And they're given not one-twelfth of a denarius, but a denarius. A whole day's wage. You can imagine, that would have been astounding to them. This would have been 12 times the going rate. Imagine the elation of those one-hour workers. And imagine the new escalated expectations for every guy who worked longer than one hour. The six-hour workers are thinking, we're getting six denarii. The 12-hour workers are thinking, we're getting 12. Verse 10, but each received a denarius. All of them got the same. You know who's most mad about that? The 12-hour workers. They've been there since 6 a.m. Verse 10, they thought they would receive more. Verse 11, they grumbled at their master. They protested, verse 12, they only worked one hour. You've made them equal to us. We have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. We get it, don't we? I mean, can you relate? I, I know the kids in here can. Kids, when brother and sister were told by mom or dad to go clean up, a room 
And one worked pretty hard, and the other one, the younger one, it's always the younger one, <laughs> they goofed off, they piddled their time away, they actually pulled more toys out, you cleaned up those two, and you walk out of the clean room, and dad says, good job, you two. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair. Kids know about fairness. They, they are finely attuned to what's not fair. And so are grown-ups. Grown-ups with jobs. I mean, could you imagine you put in your 40 hours, you get X amount, and you find out that this joker who... I went to the casino some days. He skipped work. He ended up working seven hours that week. He gets the same? That's not fair. We're supposed to feel the seeming unfairness of this situation. It's actually not good business practice. You don't want to like arbitrarily give out Christmas bonuses. There's a rationale for how you do that stuff. That's good business. Jesus isn't teaching good business here. He's showing us that sometimes our justice meter gets in the way of fully seeing the generosity and graciousness of our God. It gets in the way. The landowner says, verse 13, I, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Do you begrudge my generosity? This parable is not about, as I said, business practices. The parable is not contra-capitalism, teaching that God wants everyone to have the same amount of money, no matter how much or how little they work. The passage isn't about some getting converted later in life. Some have used it that way. It's probably also not about Gentiles coming into the kingdom in this late hour of the New Testament era compared with Jews who have known Yahweh God for millennia. The parable is about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like. It teaches us that entering the kingdom is all about grace. The parable shows us that God freely dispenses his grace and blessings on those who seem most undeserving. The first will be last. The last will be first. Remember? Chapter 20, verse 16, and chapter 19, verse 30, though they're flipped, it's the last will be first and the first last at the end of our passage. And then at the end of chapter 19, many who are first will be last and the last first. You might be wondering, how do, who's the first? Who's the last? How do we keep this straight? Well, in the first saying, chapter 19, verse 30, the first is the rich man. He looks like he's the first in, but he's the last because he went away sad, clinging to his riches. The last? Oh, those are people like little children, forgotten, needy, dependent, unimportant. The last will be first in the kingdom of heaven. And with our parable, the last hired, the last useful, will be the most blessed by God's grace. The economics of God's saving ways are upside down and inside out compared to the world's way of thinking. God can and God does dispense his grace as he will. 
He dispenses his grace and blessings in this world in undeniably unequal measure. Unequal measure. Some go to heaven and some don't. Some have ease. Others don't. Some lose children. Others don't. No one receives any less or any worse than they deserve. Actually, all receive far more and far better than they deserve. And some get the kingdom of heaven and rule with Jesus on thrones. Some will get infinitely more than they deserve. And is God not free to give grace to whomever he wishes and however he pleases? Am I not allowed to do what I choose, what belongs to me? Grace and blessing belong to him. We don't want justice. I hope you know that. If you were to cry out to God, just give me what I deserve, you would be inviting eternal damnation on you right then. Now, the very nature of God's grace is it's just, but gracious. Yes, it's just. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's the justice and also the grace. Meeting is one. And all this should so humble us. It should make us eternally thankful. We should feel how much we don't deserve his grace. So if we are saved, if we are in the kingdom of heaven, if we have eternal life, well, we have come in like little children. We are 11th hour workers who were passed over and passed over and almost forgotten, never useful until the landowner, our father, brought us in and gave us infinitely more than we ever could earn. Even the rewards in heaven, rewards that seem like they're in light of great missionary sacrifices for the kingdom, even that, it's all of grace. Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you have not received? The problem is we think that there's plenty in our lives that we have, and we didn't receive it. We earned it. We earned it. I went to college for that. Who paid for college? Well, mom and dad did. You say, no, I, I paid for college. See? Who gave you the ability to have money, to work for money, to get money, to save money, to go to college? So that you Don't you see? It's all of grace. What do you have that you have not received? Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So we put away envy. We put away complaint. We put away comparisons with each other. Freely we've been given. Let's just give thanks and enjoy life in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you once again for this great gospel in Jesus. We pray that some would come to feel their need and look outside themselves and look to Christ today to be saved, to put all their hope in his cross and resurrection. Lord, we pray as Christians we would never forget the gospel May we never outgrow the gospel. Oh, Lord, may we live in light of it more and more, which means we grow low, which means we are 
humbled and thankful. Make us more so today for your glory and for our good. Amen. Let's stand and respond. Your grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever and sings the song of righteousness by blood and not by man. Your that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation has called my heart to enter in the joy of your salvation. By grace. That's what it's all about, God's grace, grace greater than our sin. Do you know that? Have you come to put your hope in Jesus, his blood and righteousness in your place? If so, then there's enough grace. There's more than enough grace. And for all eternity, we will give thanks to him for such grace. We pray you'd come into that today and be saved. If you have questions about it, uh, come see me or Drew or others up front after the service. We're here to visit with you and talk to you more about this Savior, about this grace. And if you're in this grace with us, well then, this is the banner over our lives. This is the banner over our church. This is the banner over our relationships with each other. It doesn't mean we don't have hard talks. We do, but it's in grace. It's under the banner of grace, and it's all to God's glory. I send you out with this benediction from 1 Thessalonians, right there in the middle. Paul says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he might establish your hearts blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. You're dismissed. <laughs>